Good morning, everybody, from Lord of the Harvest. I'm Pastor Philip, and I'm going to be opening this morning. Welcome to everybody. Good morning. And good morning. I'm opening in Luke 14, beginning in the 25th verse. Now great multitudes went with him, and he turned and said to them, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, intending to build a tower, does not sit down first and count the cost, whether he has enough to finish it? Lest after he has laid the foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king going to make war against another king does not sit down first and consider whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000? Or else, while the other is still a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks conditions of peace. So likewise, whoever of you does not forsake all he has cannot be my disciple. I want to stop there. You know, there was a multitude at this point in time in Jesus' ministry, there were throngs of people following him. And what the Lord did at that moment is he decided to separate the crowd. He's going to propose something very difficult. It was difficult for me to read it and to think about the essence of what he said. But Jesus never does anything casually. He does everything deliberately. And he's deliberately looking at these throngs of people, many of which are following him for a miracle. They want something of him. And what he's after is are those that are after wanting him, not something of him. So what he did is he offended them. <laughs> he offended me as I read it, the, you know, over and over again, you just think, how can he talk about hate? And I know that when God uses hate in his word, that's strong language. He hates divorce. And we know the remnant that's left behind after divorce. He, to hate your mother and father. Um, you know, what he was after with the crowd was he met many of their needs along the way. But that had to end. He knew that at this point in his ministry, he was heading towards Jerusalem, and he knew his imminent death. So what he was out to establish were true disciples. And the reason I'm sharing this this morning is because God's after that in us today, to become true disciples. Are we willing? So he passes an extreme test on most of their hearts, searching for the real reason for following him. Even the disciples, he said, you know, many of you follow me because you get bread. You know, there's, some, there's a need being filled in your life. And I think for many of us, as we've walked with the Lord in the beginning decade or the next decade, it, we have needs met. And we're like, this is great. I call it playing church. And today in America, many are playing church. They're looking for their needs being met, their children's needs by Sunday school being met. And if they don't get met, they leave. Now, what I want to point out is Jesus does not make a contradiction when he uses the word hate, okay? Because he commands us to love, even love our enemies. So there's no contradiction, but the language that he uses means this, you have to deny even your family when it competes with him, Amen. when it exalts itself from him. And we know many have left our church and many other churches because their family's needs aren't being met. Their children's needs are not being met. So to deny our family and serve Christ is the first price to pay that he asked. And I think at that point, it struck the heart of many in that multitude. 
and they were starting to question, well, wait a minute, you know, this is, this is not what I signed up for. The next is to consider the intent of our hearts when it comes to the cross. Now note, he says, pick up your cross, not his cross. And if you picture Jesus when he was heading to Golgotha, they, as tradition in the suffering that they caused the person being crucified, they had to carry one beam of their cross on their shoulders. And what it signified is you're only going one way. There's no going back. Yeah. You can't look back. You're heading to the cross. The other beam. So when we consider being a disciple, that's exactly the image that the Lord is, is after in this multitude to get true disciples. Are you willing to pay that cost? And I believe today with the pandemic, with the division in our country, division in the church, all of the upheaval, all of the anxiety, all of the depression, the Lord is in the midst of it saying, will you truly be a disciple of mine? Are you willing to carry that beam of suffering and not look back? Three times in this, the Lord says, if you can't, you cannot be my disciple. Three times he repeats it, cannot be my disciple. If there is any compromise, love and loyalty towards family will at some point challenge every person's heart. It's challenged mine, it challenges many of yours, and it will continue to challenge many to come. Family will rise up, and the Lord will say, are you going to serve your family, or are you going to serve me? Can't serve two masters. So to take up our cross is to literally empty out our lives of every selfish motive. And I believe what Pastor has been preaching for the last number of years about God going after deeper and deeper and deeper areas in our life. Yes. It's about being selfish, selfish, protecting our flesh, our own needs, our own desires. You know, to be a disciple is to forfeit everything. Remember the rich young ruler? Just give everything you have away and follow me, and he couldn't do it. I believe the Lord asks all of us that at certain points. What will you be willing to do to be my disciple? Suffering can't, suffering can't be defined only by physical, mental, or emotional, but rather to suffer for the sakes of others. And we've heard that from our pastor over and over again. Are we willing to suffer for each other? To pour out our own strength for others? The cross has to first come first and primary before the promise of salvation. See, we've made it too easy. Just come up to the altar and accept Jesus and your life will be great. Joel Osteen, number 101. Just God just wants you to be happy. How many of us are happy right now? Right? There's no happy word in the Bible. Joy is different. It's a root. It's interesting when you see what Jesus went on to give his examples. First, building a tower. Second, going to war. It points out that Jesus is a builder and he's a warrior. And if you're going to be a disciple, you're going to be a builder, and you're going to be at war. Yes. Amen, Amen. to that. Amen. Um, turn to Philippians 2, second chapter of Philippians, uh, verses 3 through 8. We are the circumcision who worship God in the spirit, rejoice in Christ Jesus, and have no confidence in the flesh. God is after us to have confidence only in him and not in our flesh. Amen. Though I also might have confidence in the flesh, if anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I more so, Paul says. 
circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, and he goes on and on and on and talks about who he is. Yet, indeed, I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ. These are really difficult things to embrace, saints, but we are called to suffer. We are called to embrace. And I want to close, finally, in the Gospel of John, chapter 6, first in verse um, 53, Jesus says another offense. And again, he's after dividing hearts. Those that are trying to serve two masters, those that really are not devoted and committed. And I believe you can look at the plethora of churches in the United States, and they all range in different values. Some uh, to quote my friend Barat, who came here from Kosovo, expecting that every Christian in America read the Bible and was on fire with the Lord, and he came here and said, it looks like it's mostly entertainment. That's sad. It's very sad. So Jesus offends. He says, most assuredly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. Go to verse 60. Therefore, many of his disciples, when they heard this, said, This is a hard saying. Who can understand it? And if we go down further to verse 66, he says, From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. Saints, this is what we are posed with today. Are you willing to be a disciple, or is it too hard? The things that Jesus offers, the cross, suffering for others, laying our lives down for one another and for him, is it too costly? Imagine that multitude, how many walked away and never walked with him any longer because he didn't meet their needs. Pray with me this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, that you have called not many, but I believe that, Lord of the harvest, you have called us to stand with you, to suffer for others, to lay our lives down for you, and to pick up our cross daily, every day, and seek after you to build your kingdom. Lord, we want to be builders and warriors, Lord, like you. Help us, Lord. Give us the provision, Lord. Give us the need and the desire to walk side by side and to serve you. Now this morning, Lord, we want to give you praise and glory yes. and honor. Yes. You alone are God. There is no other. And we say this morning, Lord, come, Lord Jesus. Yes. Come this morning, Holy yes. Spirit. Yes. Father, let us worship you spirit in honor and spirit and truth, Lord. Yes. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. So we're, we're getting ready to uh, do our communion message. So um, I need to acknowledge you guys in Facebook land as well. I didn't. And um, thank you for being with the Lord of the Harvest this morning. We're going to go to Genesis chapter 3. <clears throat> and what does Genesis chapter 3 have to do with communion? Well, let's see. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord had made. He said to the woman, did God actually say, you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may not eat of the tree of, of the fruit of the tree in the midst of the garden. But God said, you shall eat of the fruit of the tree in the midst of the garden. That's me. Every time I get up here, my stomach just turns. So pray for me. He said to, to the woman, did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? 
And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the tree in the garden. But, the, the, but God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the, gar of the tree in the midst of the garden. Neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die, for God knows when you eat of it, your eyes will be open, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was delight to the eye, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate, and she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. This, I'm going to stop right here for one minute. It, it's like, to me, right here, God is doing some things in us, but then he gave Adam and Eve so much, and it still wasn't enough. They still had desires in their heart. So what the serpent did was tap into their desires that was already there. So the serpent, it's like if you're not focused on the things of God, if that's not where your focus is, if your focus is all over the place, but you can't hear, you can't see. So when someone come and say, oh, you can do that, it's okay. So then you do it, and then you find yourself in sin. Then the eyes of both of them were open, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves linen cloth. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees. But the Lord God called to the man, and said to him, where are you? He already knew where they were, but he wants you to tell, tell him where you are. They didn't do nothing that God wasn't familiar with. And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid. You heard the Lord, the creator of the heaven and the earth, and you were afraid. You were afraid of the God that created you of the God that gave you dominion, you were afraid. Because I was naked and I hid myself, he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, the woman. Yeah, that woman you gave me. The woman you gave to me. She gave me fruit of the tree and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this that you have done? The woman said, the serpent deceived and I ate. Deception can come when there is desires. Deception comes when there are secret compartments of our hearts that we have not surrendered to God. Deception comes when you're so focused on like what Pastor Philip was saying. It's not that God hates our family, but when that's your focus and your focus is not him, then how can you intercede for your family? That's right. How can you be that person that when you see that there's no one else interceding and you say you love God and you want to see them come to God, how can they come to God when your perception is to focus on what's there instead of focus on the things that God has told us to focus on, whatever is good, whatever is lovely, and of a good report, and let God deal with the rest. See, I, I, my name, Joyce, it ain't Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. So we're going to go to um, Luke. I thought Pastor Philip was going to go to um, my scripture this morning when he said, look, I did. But I'm going in 24. And this is when Jesus was um, already removed from the tomb. Hallelujah. He's no longer there. The women then already told them he's no longer there. 
24 and 28. The very day two of them were going to the village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, Jerusalem. And they were talking with each other about all the things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing together, Jesus drew near them and went with them. Jesus come near us and he's with us. But watch this. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what is this conversation you are holding with each other as you walk? And they said, and they stood still, looking sad, looking like what Jesus had discussed with them before the cross, they forgot. Then one of them named Cephas answered and answered him, are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened? Where are these day in these days? And he said to them, What things? And they said to him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet. Jesus was a prophet. You know, they're gonna talk like past tense. Jesus is. And um he he's everything we need. A man that was a prophet to the people. And how the chief priests and the rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. So Jesus said, yes, really. I'm right here with you. And you still don't know who I am. And beside all this, it's now the third day since these things happened. Seem like that out of your own mouth. It's now the third day. What did Jesus say about the third day? You know, so um, moreover, some women of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning. And when they did not find his body, they came back saying that they had even seen a vision of an angel who said that he was alive. So the word spread, he is alive. So some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said. But him they did not see. And he said to them, oh foolish ones and slow of heart, to believe all that the prophets had spoken. Who was it not necessary that Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. So they drew near to the village to which they were going. He lifted, he acted as if, this is Jesus acting as if he were going further, but they urged him strongly saying, stay with us for it is toward evening and the day is now far spent. So he went to stay with them. When he was ate the table with them, he took the bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to them. And their eyes were open and they recognized him and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, did not our hearts burn, with, burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures? Jesus was the scriptures. Jesus was with them. For us right now, my brothers and sisters, I just pray that deception and every compartment of our heart is something that we surrender to the Father. Every compartment, 
We don't know. I don't know what's going to happen five minutes from now. But I trust God's process. And even with your unsaved loved ones or someone that's dealing with an illness, trust God's process. We don't know the process. We don't know along the line what's being done in that process. We don't know along the line whom that individual is impacting. I'm going to say Jackie. Jackie has impacted so many people. So many people have gathered together in prayer to the Father for Jackie. So it's, it's not about what, that's what we do. But we don't want to miss the presence of the Lord by being so consumed with the circumstances around us. Right. So let's surrender our wills totally to yeah. the Father. And as the father broke the bread and their eyes were open, it's like the blindness that affected um, Adam and Eve was because of disobedience. God told them not to. And, and, and blindness, again, is because your heart is not so connected that you don't even know you're with the father. Amen. You don't even know he's talking. You don't know this. So, Lord, we don't want that. I don't want it. I don't want to be in a place where I think, I, oh, I think this, I, oh, I think this is God. No, I don't want that place. I want a place of knowing. God gives us peace. He gives us love. He gives us patience. He gives us hope. These are things that he gives us. He's, he give us grace that we extend grace to others. And that's what comes in the breaking of bread. So let's partake. Thank you, Lord, for the body, Lord. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, I the sacrifice, Lord. I just thank you. I glory in it. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. And Lord, I thank you for the blood that was shed for the iniquity of our sins, which are many, Lord. Thank you, Lord, Thank you. for your sacrifice. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thank, you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. So God bless you, brothers. Amen. For the word, we're going to continue in the book of Isaiah. And uh, we'll go to Isaiah 42. We'll take a review of the servant songs because we want to look at the work of the servant of the Lord in 2nd Isaiah which is the prophecy that runs from chapter 40 through 55 remember as we're going to Isaiah 42 Isaiah 40 through 55 is a scene in God's throne room of judgment all of Israel all the nations of the earth, all the gods of the nations, Yahweh, the Lord, the King, is there. Prophets are there. The heavenly council is there. Nations and rulers of nations are there. And in the middle of this throne room scene, this scene of judgment where the Lord in essence, declares his rule over all humanity, over all the cosmos, over all of human history. That will is declared by Yahweh. And the central figure in this is the servant of the Lord. And we know there are four servant songs. We've been teaching on that. Taught it on Sundays and in our Bible studies on Wednesday and We've been discussing it among ourselves. The four servant songs are Isaiah 42, particularly verses 1 through 9. Isaiah 49, 1 through 7. We'll look at Isaiah 50, verses 4 through 11 today. And then, of course, the end of Isaiah 52, 52, 13, and the entire chapter of 53, 53. 1 through 12, those are the four servant songs. And so 
we can look at those four songs to understand what God's purpose is for the man whom he raises up. We also talked last week that in the three parts of Isaiah, first Isaiah 1 through 39 in chapter 11, there's this figure, the spirit of the Lord comes upon him. He's the son of David. The spirit comes on the servant of the Lord in second Isaiah 40 through 55. And the spirit of the sovereign Lord comes on the Messiah, the messianic figure in Isaiah 62. And so if Isaiah is a picture of the gospel and you know, the early church called the book of Isaiah the fifth gospel. It was referred to so much along with Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. In fact, the early church saw that Isaiah so reflected Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And so this figure, one of the reasons, of course, is this figure emerges in every part of the book of Isaiah that says, apart from the son of David, apart from the servant of the Lord, apart from the Messiah, there will be no fulfillment of God's purposes in human history. And of course, that's the, the lesson that stands before us. And we want to look at the specific things that this servant of the Lord did. What was, what was his primary task? And of course, Isaiah 42, verse 1 says, Behold my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom my soul delights. I've put my spirit on him. And then three times justice is mentioned. I'll put my spirit on him. First, he'll bring forth justice to the nations. In verse 1. In verse 3, at the end, he will faithfully bring forth justice. In verse 4, he will not grow faint or be discouraged till he has established justice in the earth and the coastlands wait for his law. Not only will he establish justice in Israel, but he'll establish justice in the nations of the earth. And then verse 6, the Lord says concerning the servant, I am the Lord, I am Yahweh, I have called you in righteousness. I will take you by the hand and keep you. I will give you as a covenant for the people, a light for the nations. And in this work of righteousness, this work of justice, this work of the spirit on the servant, you will open eyes that are blind. You will bring out the prisoners from the dungeon and from prison those who sit in darkness. And then the Lord simply says, Behold, the former things in verse 9 have come to pass, and new things I now declare. Before they spring forth, I tell you of them, sing to the Lord a new song. The servant is going to do a new song. And so we see the first task of the servant is to bring forth justice. In the second servant song, in Isaiah 49, now that song First one in Isaiah 42, the Lord speaks about the servant. But now in 49 and 50, the servant himself is going to speak in the second and third servant text. And of course, in the final servant song, servant text in Isaiah 53, once more, the Lord is going to speak about the servant. So the servant here says that in verse 2, he, that's the Lord, has made my mouth like a sharp sword. In the shadow of his hand, he's hid me. He's made me a polished arrow in his quiver. He hid me away. So the servant, the second aspect of the servant's task is he's going to be dealing with warfare. There's going to be opposition to this message of justice. Isn't that strange to think that there would be an opposition to a message of God's blessing? of God's healing, of God's reconciliation, of God's graciousness, of God's kindness. Well, as Sister Joyce shared from Genesis 3, the man and the woman were given everything, but still they have desires. Yeah. And those desires cause them to oppose the Lord's creation or in Isaiah, the Lord's justice. The Lord has said to me, you are my servant, Israel, in whom I will be glorified. And remember we said that 
Israel is called the servant, but there's also this individual servant who's also the son of David and the Messiah who emerges, and their histories are so intertwined. The history of the servant is intertwined with the history of God's people. And so the final conclusion we're going to make is when we see the four aspects that the servant is to be involved in to bring God's justice to the earth and God's righteousness to the earth and establish God's mission in the earth, that will also be on us as the disciples of the Lord, as those whose history is intertwined. We are also the servant of the Lord corporately. And if the servant is to bring justice, then our first focus is to bring justice. If the servant is going to be opposed in bringing forth the mission of the Lord and will have to do spiritual warfare, then in our bringing forth the mission of the Lord, there will be opposition. As I mentioned this week, last Sunday was a powerful outpouring of the Spirit. This Sunday was a powerful outpouring of the Spirit as we gather. And next Sunday will be a powerful outpouring of the Spirit as we gather together. And Sunday was just off the charts. It was the glory of the Lord. It was the Lord speaking. It was the Lord revealing. It was the Lord healing. It was the Lord just touching me with his grace. And then Monday was horrible warfare. Well, that's just reality. That's how it works. 42, the spirit of the Lord is on me to bring forth justice and he's going to support me to bring forth a new song, create something new in the earth. And then Monday is warfare and opposition. But you see, Tuesday was then the Lord countered with his answer. And the Lord said, the warfare is nothing. See, we're to persevere through the warfare yes. Amen. to establish the mission of the Lord. Yes. And this mission, you are my servant Israel in whom I will be glorified. The mission is to glorify the Lord. It's just so strange. I mean, we, in our world, in our, in our own nation, in the nations of the earth, you know, human beings bend things and distort things. And as, as Luther said, we're twisted and bent inwardly. We, we, we take the focus off the real thing, the real issue, which is bringing glory to the Lord. That's the mission of the servant. And we turn things inwardly just as the man and the woman did. No, the mission of God is to fulfill my desires. The mission of God is to bless me. But the mission of God is to glorify the Lord, or as Pastor Philip shared from Luke 14, the mission of the Lord is to make disciples. But I said, and see, remember, being discouraged, being fatigued, being wearied in the midst of warfare is not sin. It's human. Even the servant whom we know is from our, our, our New Testament perspective where we can look back at these verses, the servant is God and man. He's the God man, but even the God man can say, I've said because of the warfare, I've labored in vain. I've spent my strength for nothing and vanity. Yet surely my justice is with the Lord and my recompense with my God. See, the, the servant who's going to bring justice has to remember that his justice too is with the Lord. His justice is not with himself. Do you understand what self-justification is? What self-righteousness is? Self-justification and self-righteousness says, my justice is with me. It's up to me to get justice for myself. It's up to me. And that's fatiguing. Do you understand when, when you take upon yourselves things that only the Lord God himself can do, we get tired. Yes. We get tired bearing a burden that only the Lord can. And so the way out of discouragement and back into encouragement, the way out of courage 
is discouragement, the way back into courage is encouragement. Our encouragement is when we remember my justice is with the Lord and my recompense with my God. My recompense means my pay. Do we understand that we're being paid to serve the Lord? Now that sounds like a contradiction of John 10. The hireling is one who works for wages. The good shepherd is the one who lays down his life for the sheep. But we are actually being paid by the Lord. Our payment is that we will see the Lord glorified by our lives. See, that's my pay. My pay is to see him glorified. My pay is to eat the bread of heaven. My pay is to, and Jesus said, my food. I don't need food from you, disciples. I'm doing the work of the Lord. That's my food. The glory that comes to the Lord through the work that I'm doing for him, that's, that's my recompense. That's my pay. And now the Lord says, he who formed me from the womb to be his servant, to bring back Jacob to him, and that Israel might be gathered to him, for I am honored in the eyes of my Lord. The Lord honors us with an anointing and a ministry. He honors us with being the servant of the Lord. My God has become my strength. This is how he honors us. He says, it is too light a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and bring back the preserved ones of Israel. I also will make you a light to the nations that my saving help, my salvation, may reach to the end of the earth. So the mission is to not only build up God's people, but it's to bring the gospel to the nations of the earth. And now that brings us to the third servant psalm, servant song, servant text in Isaiah 50, verses 4 through 11. So the disciple, the, the, excuse me, the servant of the Lord, who is also the disciple of the Lord, which we'll see momentarily, that was a, a, a preview slip. The servant of the Lord brings justice. The servant of the Lord, in the, in the face of warfare, establishes the mission of God to build up God's people in his strength and his grace and his purposes and to bring the gospel to the nations of the earth. So now we come to the fourth, or the third servant song in the fourth verse of Isaiah 50. And the servant again speaks. And he's going to say, four times here, he's going to say, the Lord God. And that's the sovereign Lord. That's Yahweh the master in Hebrew. He's Yahweh. He's the Lord who is our Father who is in relationship to us, but he's also Adonai, Yahweh. He's the master, the master of the universe, the master of the nations. And it is the sovereign God who gives and empowers the servant to carry out the mission. And this third aspect of his mission, the Lord God, the sovereign Lord has given me the tongue of, of one who is discipled. The purpose of the servant is to make disciples, not make converts, not make church members, not bring people into a, a kind of organization known as the church. It's to make disciples. And again, Philip hit the nail on the head, not knowing what I was going to speak about, but he introduced because the Spirit, there's this, there's this context that the Spirit establishes. The servant is a disciple maker. This is the third aspect of his mission. The Sovereign Lord has given me a tongue of a disciple that I may know how to sustain with a word him who is weary, morning by morning, he awakens. He awakens my ear to hear as those who are discipled. He has the tongue of a disciple maker because he has the ear of a disciple. Wow. The Lord opens the ear 
of the servant of the Lord to make him a disciple so that as his ear is open and he hears the father speaking and he does what the father tells him to do, the servant now has a tongue of a disciple maker. And that tongue of the disciple maker is one who knows how to sustain with a word those who are weary. Discipleship is the primary focus, the primary objective of the servant of the Lord. He takes God's wearied people and he gives them a word of help a word of strength, a word of empowerment, a word of direction to move them from weariness into discipleship. Now this, this is specifically referring to something that took place earlier in 2nd Isaiah. 2nd Isaiah began with chapter 40 and chapter 40 is kind of like the prophetic overview the prophetic summary, the prolegomena to the entire courtroom scene, the 16 chapters of Isaiah 40 through 55. And remember in Isaiah 40, this is what is stated. Just go back to Isaiah 40 briefly. Remember Isaiah 40 Actually, the first verse, remember, the purpose of Second Isaiah, of this throne room scene where the Lord establishes how he is going to fulfill his eschatological purposes in human history, how he's going to bring about his kingdom purposes in human history. It begins in 40 verse 1. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry out to her that her warfare is ended. Remember, this is the prophecy that announces Israel's going to return from exile. Israel has been in exile. And brethren, when we suffer, when we struggle, when the purposes of the Lord seem so distant from our lives, when we see nothing but failure, when we experience so much warfare and so much pain and so much suffering and so much difficulty, the church is in exile. But the Lord calls us back from exile. And it is the, the, our being called back from exile and being returned to rebuild Jerusalem and rebuild the city walls and rebuild the temple and allow God's presence to dwell in the midst of his people once again, that is the comfort that God brings. Yes. That's the role of the servant of the Lord, and that's discipleship. Yes. The Lord is, that's the new song that God is going to establish in our midst. Cry to Jerusalem, tell her her warfare is ended, her iniquity is pardoned. And she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. You know, as firstborn sons and daughters, the firstborn got the double portion of inheritance. We always talk about the double portion of inheritance. Do you understand the firstborn gets a double portion of God's discipline as well? Yes, that's right. That's what it means to be chosen yeah. by the Lord. The fact that you're chosen. See, uh, Proverbs makes it very clear. He who does not discipline his son, what does scripture say? Hates his son. Eh, I don't worry about what that child, just, child's got a mind of his own, a mind of her own, just, just let him go and do what? See, the, the unwillingness to discipline a child, it speaks of an, a lack of love on the part of that parent. Yeah. That parent is just, again, caught up in his or her own stuff. But the chosen son of the father, 
the one upon whom the Father sets his love and pleasure, which ought to be all his children, of course. That gets the double portion of inheritance, but the double portion of discipline. Lord, why do you, why, why do you discipline me so much? Oh, son, daughter, it's because I love you so much. And this comfort is calling a wearied people who have been in exile for 70 years, come back to the land and the Lord is going to be with you. The Lord is going to be there to bring you through weariness and to strengthen you. And that's why at the end of Isaiah 40, it says, 40, 27, Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord and my right is disregarded by my God. Israel's, you know, making a complaint. Uh, he's, he's complaining, again, Israel's complaining, my right, where is my justice? Mm -hmm. See, Israel sees the, the disciplining hand of God as, as being a lack of justice. So the Lord says, okay, I won't argue with you there. Sometimes justice is set aside for discipline. Sometimes blessing and peace is set aside for chastisement. This is what happens. So, okay, you're making a complaint. Where is my justice? Well, even the servant himself in the second song is going to say, where's my justice? So keep in mind that when we have those seasons and we cry out to God, why is this happening? You know, you need to say that in a more biblical way. Where's my justice, Lord, in this? And the Lord will say, oh, okay. Here's where your justice is. It's in the servant. He's become your righteousness. He's become your justice. So, so thank you for reminding me, and I'm going to bring you into justice. So as they complain, my way is hidden from the Lord, and my justice is disregarded by my God, the Lord answers and says, Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not grow faint. He does not grow weary. You're faint. You're weary. He's not. Yet, his understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint. And to him who has no might, he increases strength. Even youth shall faint and be weary, and young men shall fall exhausted. But they who wait on the Lord, they who rest in the Lord, they who trust in the Lord, they who place their hope in the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Yes. Now, what is that process going to be? Whereby the weary become strong? Whereby the weary mount up on wings as eagles? Discipleship. And it's the discipleship that the servant brings. Discipleship. He knows how to sustain with a word those who are weary. Mike Osminski, perishing under the weight and the oppression and the confusion and the hostility and the negativity. For years I've said, if I can but hear his voice, I'll be okay. And then when he speaks, I'm lifted up out. Yeah. I'm lifted up on wings of eagles. See, it's the voice of the Lord speaking into us, speaking through the Spirit, speaking by Jesus, speaking through our leaders who themselves are disciples and now can become disciple makers that the weary are raised up. Yeah. Now before we turn back to Isaiah 50, while we're in Isaiah 40, I might as well show you one more thing. This idea, this, this Hebrew word for disciple, he has a tongue of a disciple maker because he has an ear of a disciple maker. That Hebrew word for disciple maker occurs in 
four different places in the book of Isaiah. Three times in 2 Isaiah, one in 1 Isaiah. The place where it is in 1 Isaiah is a whole other teaching. And maybe we'll do that next week or another week. But while we're here, the first occurrence of discipleship, that term that, again, it's a rare word in Hebrew. It's not used a lot in the Old Testament, but it's in four different places in Isaiah three in, 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 in Isaiah 40 through 55. Go back to verse 12 of Isaiah 40. Remember we said this chapter is the summary chapter. It's got contained just about everything in it, what's going to take place in this courtroom scene of the 16 chapters, 40 through 55. 4012, the heavenly council is speaking here. The Yahweh speaks and then the prophet speaks and then the heavenly council speaks and then the servant speaks. I mean, then Israel speaks. I mean, we, we, we have all of this going on because we're in a courtroom situation. We're in an ancient Near Eastern courtroom setting and everybody's there and they want a verdict rendered. They want a judicial decision rendered. You know, when we talk about covenant as being central to the, the, the unfolding of God's purposes in both the Old and New Testament, do you understand? Covenant is a legal terminology. Covenant is central because the throne room of the Lord all throughout Scripture is a central figure, a central picture, a central reality. In Daniel 7, Daniel goes into the heavenly courtroom. In Isaiah 40 through 55, Isaiah's in the heavenly courtroom. The whole book of Revelation, John is in the heavenly courtroom. When Jesus is in the courtroom of the Sanhedrin with his life on the line before he's crucified, and they're accusing him and accusing him, and he just sits there silently, and finally they say, Are you, listen, you're not going to say anything. Don't you know we have the power of your life and death in our hands? Are you not going to say anything? And finally the Lord wakes up and says, oh no, you don't have, uh, you don't have it. I'm not, this isn't a human court that I'm in. What does he quote? He goes, from henceforth you shall see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of the Almighty coming in the clouds of heaven. And he quotes Daniel 7 to him. Jesus says, I'm not in your courtroom. I'm in the heavenly court. In, in 1 Corinthians 4, when Paul says, listen, Corinthians, you're putting me on trial. You're saying I'm not really a true apostle. I'm a false apostle. Gee, I led you guys all to the Lord, but now you're turning on me that I'm a false apostle. And he says in 1 Corinthians 4, actually, he goes, I don't, I don't really care what your judgment is. I, I'm not in any human court at all anyways. You have no power to judge me. The one who judges me is the Lord. See, Paul lived his apostolic life out of being in the courtroom of the Lord. Do we get that? Here, here's what I want to say. We're a prophetic church. How many of you live in the courtroom of the Lord? Live your lives out of the courtroom. And always recognize, and it's, that just means it's the Spirit of the Lord always bringing you back through the Word and through grace and through the exhortation of our brothers and sisters we're not in any human courtroom no president no political party no world ruler no world religion no 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 philosopher no some kind of world view determines what takes place in my life Amen. i live in the heavenly courtroom See, when David would say, judge me, O Lord, where was David living? He was living out of the courtroom of heaven. He just, he understood. He lived in the courtroom of heaven. So the, the heavenly council says this, who has measured, 40 verse 12, the waters in the hollow of his hand and marked off the heavens with a span, enclosed the dust of the earth in a measure, and weighed the mountains in scales and the hills in balance. And we know the answer, nobody. <laughs> Nobody's done that. Oh, yes, Yahweh has. The Lord has. 
Who has measured the spirit of the Lord or what man, what human being shows the spirit of Yahweh counsel? None. Whom did he consult and who made him understand? And the him, of course, now here is the Lord. Who has consulted with the Lord and who gave discernment to the Lord to help the Lord make a judicial decision in his courtroom. That's what it's saying in the Hebrew. And then it says, who, and if I'm reading ESV, who taught him the path of justice, who taught him knowledge? Who taught is the Hebrew word disciple. Well, who, who discipled the Lord in terms of justice. Oh, I know, the social justice advocates. No. Oh, wait, I know, the justice of the right, the justice of the left, the justice of democracy, the justice of communism, the justice of Islam. Nope. None of them discipled the Lord in justice. He's going to disciple us in justice. And how is he going to do it? He's going to send his servant. As servants of the Lord, our first mission is this. See, he's like, Pastor Isaac, you keep talking about justice. What is justice? That's the point, brethren. Figure it out. We need to understand what justice is. See, the church, now I'm going to say this. If you were raised in a black congregation, if you were raised in a Hispanic congregation, if you were raised in an indigenous congregation, oh, you know what justice is. But see, most of the church doesn't have a clue what justice is. Because everything's fine. When, when everything's fine and good in your life, you're not worried about justice. When justice has been taken from you, oh, then you learn what justice is. So nobody's discipled the Lord in terms of justice, and nobody has the second. It says again, and no one has taught him knowledge. No one has taught him revelation. And no one has shown him the path of discernment that leads to judicial renderings. So now we go back to Isaiah 50 and you kind of get the picture here. The Lord God has given me the tongue of one who is discipled that I may know how to sustain, assist, help, heal, deliver, restore. That word means all kinds of things. Do you know that that word right there, this is, this is, this is how things work when you do a little study of the language. That word in the Hebrew text there that says, he's given me a tongue of a disciple that I may know how to sustain with a word him who is weary is used one place in the Old Testament, right here. Now, what's hard about a one-time use of a word is you say, well, what the heck does that word mean? I mean, can, can I look at it in, in like 10 other occurrences, 10 other contexts, 10 other places, so I know what that word means? Well, here's what I think the point of that word is. There's a secret of sustenance that belongs to Jesus and Jesus only. You don't know it. I don't know it. The world doesn't know it. St. Augustine doesn't know it. Martin Luther King Jr. didn't know it. Dietrich Bonhoeffer didn't know it. Peter, James, and John didn't know it. Only Jesus knows it. And therefore only Jesus, the Father, and the Spirit know it. But here's the thing. You know how we know it? Because when he brings it to us, oh, we know it. It's Pastor Oz saying, all is lost, all have left me, nobody listens, 
Nobody's paying attention. Everybody's against me. I'm a failure. What is going on? And a word comes from yes. the Father. A word comes from Jesus. Yes. And like I say, I'm all right. Yes. Yes. You know why I will survive anything? Do you know why if I have to face martyrdom, I'm going to survive it? Yes. Do you know why if I'm going to face horror and tragedy, I'm going to survive it? Do you know why there will be nothing that the devil can bring against me that I won't survive? Do you know why that's an inevitability? Do you, see, I'm not worried about whether I'm going to succeed. My success is guaranteed inevitable by the Father. You know why? Because all it takes is that word to come. Yeah. And everything's all right. Oh, thank you. This is discipleship. And see, we need to become disciple makers. Those whom the Lord opens their ears yes. to hear that word from Jesus yes. will then have tongues that can speak that word to others. Yes. Yes. See, I, I, I first learned it with all my spiritual fathers. I just need Jimmy J to tell me something. Jimmy Johnston, I just need to go and Jim might chew me out. Jim might put up his hands in exasperation with me. Jim might show me love. Jim might show me correction. Jim might just laugh with me. But I need to hear, his, hear him say that. My first one was Jimmy J, and then it was Jim Murphy. And I just needed to hear Jim. I just need, yeah. I, I'll, I gotta call Jim up. I gotta call Jim and Carolyn up. Jim, can I hear your voice? Tell me something about my life. Or, usually, let me talk to you for 45 minutes about how bad things are, and then all I need is just say, say one thing to me, Jim. Yes. <laughs> I learned it with Mr. Todd. We used to laugh with Mr. Todd. We would be, our lives would be flipping out and we'd say, let's go talk to Bruce. And Alex and I would say, and he's going to tell us this, this, this. And we knew what he was going to say. Yep. Bruce said the same thing all the time. We'd go and he'd say it. We'd walk away. We were all right. The world was okay. <laughs> you know who Jimmy J was? And Jim Murphy, Bruce Todd, Matt Parker, yeah. Papa Pete Beck. You know who all those guys are? They're people to whom the Sovereign Lord has given the tongue of a disciple maker because their ears yes. are open to the disciple maker Good. themselves. See, this is what the servant of the Lord... See, this is a real pastor, guys. Yeah. This is a real five-fold leader. This is a real minister. They're the servant of the Lord. The Sovereign Lord has given me the tongue of those who are discipled that I may know how to sustain with a word him who is weary. Morning by morning, he awakens. He awakens my ear to hear as those who are discipled. The Lord God, the Sovereign Lord has opened my ear. So it talks here about, it talks here about an ear that is awakened, it's aroused. It's like, you know, when you come out of a sleep, yes. you're, you, you're, you're in one state and you come into another state. The, the word of the Lord brings us into another state, a heavenly state. That's an awakening. Then the ear is open. It's awakened and then it's open. It's open up so the Lord can deposit something in it. I just want to take a couple minutes and look at a couple pictures of the ear being awakened, the ear being open. There are other images. Do you know in Samuel, we won't turn to it, but uh, I think it's 1 Samuel 9, verse 15, if you want to write it down. It says that the, the word of the Lord was revealed to Samuel. And so I looked it up in the Hebrew text, and it literally says, the ear of the Lord, the ear of Samuel was unlocked by the Lord. Wow. That's what revelation is. 
The Lord unlocks our ears. Yeah. He arouses our ears, awakens our ears. He opens our ears. That's like a, a closed door being opened. He unlocks our ear. Psalm 40 is another image. Go with me to Psalm 40. It's Psalm 40, which, which we studied a number of times when we went through the Psalms, is a picture of God opening the ear of the psalmist. And, 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 and it, it's a, it's, it just gives you another image to understand this process of discipleship. Psalm 40. To the choir master, a psalm of David, verse 1, I waited patiently for the Lord. So you got to wait on the Lord. Do you, do you know what, what presumption is? Presumption is rushing ahead when the Lord has not spoken. Saul... I want you to wait here till I come, Samuel says. See, Samuel's trying to disciple Saul, and he knows that you have to learn how to wait on the Lord. And it's going to be, and, and you know, waiting on the Lord isn't like it's a nice, quiet, comfortable, restful day, and I can just sit around and put my feet up. Waiting on the Lord is when you're in the midst of panic. Yes. Amen. And everything's going wrong yes. for Saul, and Samuel isn't showing up. And so what does Saul do? He just, he's panicking, so he listens to his own heart and does what he wants to do. He, he, he impetuously moves, and Samuel comes and says, well, you just lost the kingship, Saul. If you can't wait on the Lord, you can't be king. So David says, I waited patiently for the Lord, and the Lord inclined to me. You know what it means to incline? The Lord put his ear down to hear my voice. See, when we hear God's voice in our ear, then our voices will be heard in God's ear as well. Amen. Why aren't my prayers being answered, Lord? Have you learned how to listen to him so that he might listen to you? I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined to me and heard my cry. Now notice, he's, 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 it's quicksand. He's in the midst of a Scottish a Scottish bog that the Elliots, you know, Rob's riding his bike and here comes a Scottish bog. And the Lord says, oops, got to help you out here, Rob. I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined to me and heard my cry. It's quicksand, okay? He drew me up from the pit of destruction out of the miry bog. He set my feet upon a rock, making my steps secure. And see, what does he tell the servant he's going to do? New song, new thing. Yes. Yes. It's discipleship. New song, new thing. He put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. The new song causes people to fear the Lord and, and be set free from the spirit of fear. And the fear of the Lord isn't a bad thing. It's a good thing. The fear of the Lord causes you to hope in God, trust in God, believe God. Blessed is the man who makes the Lord his hope, his trust, his confidence, his rest, who does not turn to the proud, to those who go astray after the lie. In the Hebrew, it's those who fall away to the lie. You have multiplied, O Lord my God, your wondrous deeds and your thoughts toward us. None can compare to you. I will proclaim and tell of them, yet they are more than can be told. And watch how the psalmist begins to get a word because he's being discipled by the word of the Lord. He gets to get words to disciple others and and to rescue the weary. He's a wearied person being rescued by the Lord, and the Lord's going to give him words to rescue other wearied ones. Your wondrous deeds and thoughts toward us, none can compare with you. I will proclaim and tell of them, yet they are more than can be told. In sacrifice and offering you've not delighted, you have dug out my ear. See? He awakens the ear, he opens the ear, he unlocks the ear, he digs out the ear. 
burnt offering and sin offering you've not required. And what does the opening of the ear, what, what response does it birth in the psalmist? Then I said, behold, I have come. In the scroll of the book, it's written to me, I delight to do your will, O oh my God. Your instruction is in my heart. Your Torah, your instruction, your teaching is in my heart. Now, please, brethren, this is why it's so important to hear God's voice speak into our hearts to dig out our ear and open our ear and awaken our ear and unlock our ear. How does God bring the universe into existence? He speaks it into existence. How does God, Lord, I, I don't want to do your will. Open your ear. He'll speak the very desire into your heart to do his will. Lord, I don't think I can handle this situation. Oh, let him speak yes. the faith into your being. Yes. See, you don't have to, see, this is the difference between following the Lord in your own strength and doing it God's way. You don't have to generate strength. God's grace gives us the ability to understand God's will. When we don't, when we understand it, or when we don't understand it, His grace gives us the ability to understand it. When we understand it but don't desire to do it, His grace gives us the ability to understand and desire to do it. And then, you know, understanding God's will, desiring to do it doesn't necessarily mean you have the strength to do it. So, well, guess what? His grace speaks the ability to do God's will. See, here, this is what discipleship is. A disciple is a learner. Yeah. One who opens his ears to hear the voice of the master, and the voice of the master does the rest. How will I face this, 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 and this in my life? You know, we're so bound by fear. I don't know if I could do this or that. No, 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 no. Don't be bound by fear by that. That's a true statement. You don't have the ability to do anything, and you ought to be afraid. Oh, but wait a second, there's an answer. Yes. Yeah, I, I can't do that. Oh, Lord, speak it into me. Yes. Behold, I've come. In the scroll of the book, it's written to me. I delight to do your will, O God. Your law is within my heart. Mm. See, after his ear gets open, his delight is in the things of the Lord because the Lord speaks that into his heart. Never say... See, people get mad at me because I'll, I, I'm gonna, I'll say something because I know you have to go in this direction. You might not even see what, what's going wrong in your life right now. In fact, some of the things that you like the best are the most dangerous to you. So I'm going to speak a word to you that you're not going to like. Why? Because I want you to get bent out of shape, because I want you to get angry, because I want you to despair. Nope, I'm just preparing you to say, well, if that's the will of the Lord, I could never do that. Good. Now, if, you, you just, you accomplished everything that my counsel wanted. Now go in the presence of the Lord. Let him dig out your ear. And after you dig out, have your ears digged out by the Lord, what was an impossibility to you before, the pleasure of the Lord will move you. I have told the glad news of righteousness in the great congregation. Behold, I have not restrained my lips, as you know, O Lord. I have not hidden your righteousness within my heart. I have spoken of your faithfulness, your salvation. I have not concealed your steadfast love and your faithfulness from the great congregation. Notice, when he has the ear of a disciple, he's given the tongue of a disciple. And the very thing that God spoke into existence in him, now he begins to share with the weary to bring comfort to them as well. As for you, O Lord, you will not restrain your mercy from me. Your steadfast love and your faithfulness will preserve me forever. Okay, one more example. Exodus 21. We have one, one final image. And this is the servant who has his ear bored through with an owl, yeah. an A-W-L, an owl, out of his devotion to his master. Remember, 
Who's speaking in the third song in Isaiah 50? The servant of the Lord. Exodus 21, verse 1. Second book of the Old Testament. Now these are the rules that you shall set before them. Moses is being instructed to set this before the sons of Israel. When you buy a Hebrew servant, that's the uh, uh, Hebrew Eved. The Eved is the servant of the Lord. He's the Eved of the Lord. When you purchase a Hebrew servant, he shall serve six years, and in the seventh he shall go out free for nothing. This is what, what bond servanthood was in the Old Testament. Most slavery that you see in the Old Testament, much of the slavery you see in Israel, was debt slavery. You were in debt, so you sold your services to somebody for seven years to pay off your debt. You didn't have the money to do it, so you worked for that person. If the servant comes in single, he shall go out single. If he comes in married, then his wife shall go out with him. In other words, if while he is a servant, he meets another servant and marries that servant, that servant, who's his wife, actually still belongs to that master, at least for that wife's seven-year time period. If his master gives him a wife and she bears him sons or daughters, the wife and her children shall be her masters, and he shall go out alone. But if the servant plainly says, this, this, is, this is incredible, the servant has a right to actually become a life servant for that master. It, the contract's seven years, so he's done with the contract after seven years, but he can become a servant for life. But if the servant plainly says, I love my master, my wife, and my children, I will not go out free, then his master shall bring him to God, a legal place in the city, in the village where the presiding judge or prophet was, and he shall bring his servant to the door or the doorpost, and his master shall bore his ear through with an awl, and he will be his servant forever. See, there are servants who so love their master that they show their eternal devotion to their master by piercing their ear and getting an earring in their ear, a pierced ear, to show that they love their master and they belong to their master forever. See, what marks us as servants forever of the Lord is we allow him to dig out our ear. We listen to his voice. Now, we're going we're gonna to go back to Isaiah 50 and close. You don't have to go there, but do you understand now when Jesus characterized his ministry as the son with the father in the gospel of John, Jesus was making reference to Isaiah 50. Do you understand that? He had the ear of a disciple in his relationship with his father so that he could be the ultimate disciple maker. When Jesus said in the gospel of John, I can do nothing of my own self. I can do nothing by myself. I can do nothing on my own. As I hear, I judge. What is judging? It's rendering justice. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just. My judgment is righteous because I seek not my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Do you understand? Jesus is declaring there as this kind of summary of his ministry in John 5. Jesus is saying, I am the servant of Isaiah 50. Let's close. Let's finish up Isaiah 50. Got a couple more minutes here and we'll do it. 
If I were at home, you'd have about another half hour, but I'm not at home, so hallelujah. We're here in the building. Okay, step back to verse 4 and we'll catch up here. The Lord God, the sovereign Lord, 50 verse 4 of Isaiah, has given me a tongue of one who is discipled, that I may know how to sustain with a word him who is weary. Morning by morning he awakens. He awakens my ear to hear as those who are taught, to hear as the disciples, to hear as those who are the discipled ones. And that word to hear is shama. Shama means to hear and obey. Hear doesn't just mean, that was a great message, Pastor. I'm leaving here and going to do whatever I want to do. Okay. Shema, the real word for hear, to hearken, is to hear and obey. And that's specifically contrasted with a word that's in verse 5. He awakens my ear morning by morning to shema, to respond, to hearken, to hear and obey as those who are disciples. See, that's what a real disciple is. One who hears and obeys. Remember Jesus said at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, the one who built his house on sand is those who hear my word and don't do it. And those who build on the rock are those who hear my word and do it. He again was talking about what real discipleship is according to Isaiah 50. Verse 5 says, The Lord God has opened my ear and I was not rebellious. You know what the Hebrew word for rebel there means? To hear and to disobey. To hear and to resist. See, rebellion and obedience is all in the hearing and the response to what we hear. The Lord God has opened my ear. I was not rebellious. I did not turn back. I didn't turn away from the Lord. I didn't withdraw. I didn't abandon the Lord. That's what that Hebrew word means. I hear and I don't remove myself from what I've heard. I obey. And then incredible verse. I gave my back to those who strike and my cheeks to those who pull out the beard. I hid not my face from disgrace and spitting. It says that the process of discipleship takes place when we hear the word of the Lord in the midst of suffering, in the midst of resistance. See, so, so the, the servant is bringing justice in 42. He has some warfare in 49, but he's going to continue the mission and be a covenant to the people. Isaiah 50, the third servant song, now it starts to bring the, out the picture of suffering. Now, everybody knows this now, but you didn't know it when Isaiah made this prophecy. You know, this prophecy was made 700 years. 700 years hundred years before Jesus would come. And that's a very specific picture of what happened with Jesus, isn't it? I gave my back to those who would whip me. He was whipped. He was beaten. I gave my cheeks to those who pulled out the beard. They pulled on his beard. They put a crown of thorns on him. They spit on him. They slapped him. They mocked him. Can you imagine Jesus reading the reading uh, in in Isaiah 700 years of tradition and then he sees himself in verse 4 and says yes the sovereign god has made me a disciple maker verse 5 the sovereign god has opened my ear I'm not going to turn back. I'm not going to be rebellious. And then all of a sudden he sees. And he tells his disciples, well, the Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of ungodly men and sinners. They're going to, sl they're going to, they're going to beat him. They're going to mistreat him. They're going to put him to death. And by the way, the suffering that you begin to see in the third servant song, of course, we've studied Isaiah 53. 
it ends up in his death. But in his death, he does what? He brings righteousness. He brings healing. He imparts the glory of God. And so here's the pattern of the suffering servant, the servant of the Lord. I bring justice. I establish the mission of the Lord. I make disciples, but I'm gonna suffer. I'm gonna die, but in my death, I'm going to be exalted. I'm gonna be elevated, and I'm gonna exalt and elevate the weary people of God with me, and I'm gonna impart the justice and the righteousness and the mission and the discipleship. And let me say, those of you, all right, leadership team, 13 of you. What is our end, brethren? It's death. Yeah. We die. The cross is a symbol of death, but it will be as we die, others will live. Yeah. As we suffer, others will be healed. As we are discipled in the midst of difficult circumstances, we will impart the supply of God to raise up other disciples who will do the same and we'll have an army. Yeah. Here we are. I'm 50 years into this. And you know what I see? The army of the Lord is now being established finally. Through the worst of times. Through the, through, I mean, you know, at one point we had 200 people at Lord of the Harvest. <laughs> and then there were 150. And then there were about 130 or 125 before the pandemic. How many do we have left now? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. This is the army of the Lord, brethren. Third time, verse 7. But... See, see this, this, this idea of I did not turn back, I didn't pull back, I didn't abandon the Lord, I didn't retreat from the Lord in the midst of suffering. See, this is how discipleship is formed. Louise used the word intentionality. Do, do you see the intentionality of the servant here? Well, let's continue. But the sovereign Lord helps me. Verse 7, third time he's mentioned sovereign Lord. See, it's, it's about the sovereign Lord. It's not about him and his suffering. It's about the sovereign Lord. But the sovereign Lord helps me. The sovereign Lord is my help me, is my assistant. Same word that's used for the man and the woman. God gave the woman to the man to be his help me. Well, the Lord is our help me. Before the woman was ever the help me, the man was ever the help me. The Lord is our help me. The Lord will be my helpmate. The sovereign Lord. Therefore, I have not been disgraced. Remember, to be disgraced, to be ashamed. This is shame isn't some internal kind of feeling that I feel yucky about myself. Shame is this voice that says, You will not succeed in the purposes of the Lord. See, we can make shame about ourselves. Well, don't be ashamed. No, 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 that, that misses the point. Don't, don't make shame about yourself. Understand what shame really is. It's saying you will not fulfill the purposes of the Lord. And your answer to shame is, oh, yes, I will. Why? Because the sovereign God is my helpmate, I will not be disgraced. I will not be ashamed. Therefore, I've set my face like a flint. You want a word for intentionality? You want a word for determination? I set my face like a flint. Philip made an allusion to it in Luke 9, when Jesus, it said, he turned his face toward Jerusalem. He knew what was going to face him, but he was resolute, he was determined. He was intentional. Now the purposes of the Lord are going to be fulfilled in me and I will not be disgraced. I will not fail. Do you understand? Do you understand why we do need a certain amount of healthy Calvinism? The sovereignty of God. 
It's inevitable that we're going to succeed, brethren. And if you know it's inevitable, you can set your face to Jerusalem because the Lord, he doesn't say, I hope the sovereign Lord will help me. He says, the sovereign Lord helps me. He makes it a statement of fact. He will never leave us nor forsake us. See, all my attacks revolve around this. You failed your children. You failed the Lord. You failed your purpose. You're a horrible husband. You're a horrible pastor. That's, that's 90% of the attacks are all in that area. And they add, and look, here's the proof. See, that's the, the attack of shame. And we answer that by setting our face like a flint and saying, oh no! That's right. Why? And we don't, and see, and, and people get caught up in this, oh, I'm a horrible parent, so I've got to be a, a good parent now. I'm a horrible husband, so now I've got to become a good husband. Or the spouse who's saying, you're a horrible spouse and you've got to become a, no! You don't have to become any of those things. You have to say, the sovereign God is with me. The sovereign God helps me. I will not be disgraced. And then you set your face like a flint. Why? And why can you do this? Because I know that I shall not be put to shame. It's the ear of a disciple. He who vindicates me is near. He who makes my righteousness to emerge is near. Who will contend with me? It's a courtroom term. Who will bring a lawsuit against me in the courtroom of heaven? Nobody. Well, let, him, let us stand up together. Who will contend with me? Well, good. Let's, let's get up together and go before the sovereign God. Who's my adversary? The Hebrew is incredible. You know, who is his adversary is his, who is the Baal of my justice? Who's Baal? The, the, the pagan God who declared that his way is true and not Yahweh. Who's going to be the, 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 the Baal of my justice? Nobody's going to be the Baal of my justice. The Lord is my, the one with whom is my justice. Who is my adversary? Go ahead, let him come near to me. And the fourth and final time, behold, the sovereign God helps me. Who will declare me guilty? Here's what we do. Here's what we declare in the face of shame. And shame is you are guilty. Guilty is charged. Guilty is proven. Guilty is demonstrated by the circumstances of your life. And the servant is saying, who? 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 And here's the answer. Behold, all of them will wear out like a garment. The moth will eat them up. Next attack that you get, the attack of shame, just say, all of them will wear out like a garment. The moth will eat them up. And here's the conclusion. Who among you fears the Lord and obeys the voice of his servant? Discipleship. Let him who walks in darkness and has no light trust in the name of the Lord and rely on his God. Now, verse 11 is a teaching for another time. It'll be the, it, it, you will we'll take verse 11 and jump into Isaiah 1, where Isaiah 1 talks about, it's the other place where discipleship is mentioned. I'll give you a spoiler alert uh, before we leave, but I said, one more time in 2nd Isaiah, do we have discipleship in Hebrew? Go with me to Isaiah 54. We'll close. Now remember, in Isaiah 53, look at the last verse of Isaiah 53. Remember, the servant starts in Isaiah 42 with, he's going to bring justice, and where does the fourth servant song end? Isaiah 53, 12. Actually, Isaiah 53, 11 and 12. Out of the anguish of his soul, 
he shall see and be satisfied. Out of the anguish of the suffering of the servant, the Lord will see and be satisfied. And by his knowledge shall my righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. He brings justice, he brings righteousness, he brings the mission of the Lord, and he brings discipleship. So after he bears the sins of many, the very last verse, Isaiah 53, 12, the servant will bear the sin of many and make intercession for the criminals. What happens next in Isaiah 54? Sing, O barren one who did not bear. Break forth into singing and cry aloud. You who have not been in labor, for the children of the desolate one will be more than the children of her who is married, says the Lord. The Lord, because of his justice and righteousness, brings forth life. And then Isaiah 54 is all this wonderful, incredible praise and worship given to the Lord. And look at what verse 13 says. All those children, the barren one, Israel, will produce. All your children shall be discipled by the Lord. Shall be discipled by the Lord. And great shall be the peace of your children. Discipleship brings peace. I was going to give you a spoiler alert, but I don't want to ruin. This is too good of a message to ruin. Ruin, ruin your morning with a spoiler alert about the last thing about discipleship. It's, it doesn't spoil this message, but it's, it's kind of a sobering message about what hinders discipleship. But, um, I'm going to ask Jan to close us out with prayer, with a, a, a prayer, a comment if she wants, or just prayer, but close us out. Well, Lord, we just thank you for this word. It's quite sobering, Lord. But I pray today for everybody watching and everybody here that you clean out our ears, dear God. Yeah. Because our hearts really do want to be discipled by you, Lord. So clean out our ears that we may hear your voice. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.